So that's the first prong is I'm thinking about my operating philosophy. And the second one is this, that people can only handle so much truth in one sitting, which is why I often leverage what I know of storytelling to help people step outside themselves and view old problems in new ways. And so as I was preparing for our time today, this particular story just kept coming to mind. So in the late 1970s, 1980s, there was this American rock band that were, they were in their prime, Van Helen. Their shows were legendary, you know, often requiring nine 18-wheeler trucks full of equipment. And as one would expect with all this equipment, their contract writers were incredibly extensive because they wanted to make sure that the venues were able to handle the equipment, the voltage requirements, all these things. And within this contract, they also had details about what they wanted to be backstage. Details like this. Absolutely no brown M&Ms in the backstage area. And if the band found brown M&Ms in the backstage area, not only were they allowed to cancel and walk away from the show, but they were entitled to full compensation. And so in his biography, David Lee Roth, who's the lead singer of the band, explained that one of the first things they did when they got to a venue to perform was they went straight to the backstage and checked to see if there were any brown M&Ms. And as soon as they checked, if they saw an M&M that didn't belong there, they would line check the entire production. Guaranteed, guaranteed going to arrive at a technical error. They didn't read the contract. Guaranteed you run into a problem. Sometimes it would be, sometimes it would threaten to, to just destroy the whole show. Something like literally life threatening. And so the M&Ms and their contract were designed and served a purpose. It was a way to determine whether the requirements had been read and complied with. And so within the haste of proudly advocating for and advancing human centricity in UX, I think many of us have failed to read the requirements. And many of us have failed, when many of us have failed, it impacts the rest of the community. And so we have failed. Within the haste of proudly advocating for and advancing human centricity in UX, most of our well-known UX leaders have failed to read the requirements. Matters related to DEI have been treated as nice to haves, something you're passionate about, something that maybe you should create some type of volunteer group to you know, dedicate time to, when in reality, it should have been at the core of everything related to human-centeredness. Why is there this dichotomy? It should deeply trouble all of us that a lot of well-known UX leaders do not know how to speak on matters relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and yet they have built their whole careers around being human-centered. That should trouble us. That should disturb us. And while we can talk about the ways that we have failed to be more human-centered in ways that acknowledge power and privilege in our approach to our practice and our craft, Today, I'd like to specifically talk about the ways that we have failed to be more human-centered in our approach to the UX community. And similar to what David Roth states, failure to read the requirements of what it means to be actually human-centered can be life-threatening. And so no wonder sometimes our community can feel like a shit show. And what's wild about that is that some of you, your ears probably perked up, some of you probably became offended because I said the word shit, and not because I drew attention to the fact that some of our actions and behaviors can be life-threatening. You know, I once heard someone say that the blame is this discharge of anger and confusion, but I want to be really clear that I'm not confused. I want to be extra clear that as a black woman, that I have the right and the entitlement to be angry as a UX professional in this industry that prides itself on being human-centered and inclusive. And while there are many requirements that have been overlooked that I can address today, today in the brief amount of time, I really just want to begin to scratch the surface on one, to understand and mitigate caucasity to the best of your ability. And the reason why I say that to the best of your ability 
is because one, it means that you can't be passive or apathetic. You actually have to try. You have to intentionally try, thoughtfully try, but nonetheless, you actually have to try. And two, I recognize that we're human and so that we're not gonna be doing this perfectly. But in that recognition, I also don't want that recognition to become an excuse for apathy and distance from actually having to do this work. This recognition offers an opportunity on our growth journeys with the goal of progress over perfection in mind. Now, what do I mean when I say caucasity? Now, caucasity is a noun. It's the group of two words, Caucasian and audacity, makes sense. And it's used to describe the thoughts, actions, feelings from white people that stem from bold instances of unchecked white privilege and or racism. White privilege consists of a variety of characteristics, including the belief that oneself cannot be racially prejudiced in an ethnocentric monocultural society. And also too, being unaware of how the prioritization of whiteness disadvantages people of color. But before we continue, I think it's important for me to break down this word and just also provide some more context because I'm sure a lot of you, um, this might be the first time you're being exposed to this kind of language. So one thing that's important to understand is caucasity is African American vernacular English. It's a, dialect of a, it's a dialect of American English that is also spoken within the black community. It's not slang because slang suggests an informal or improper use of a language. But here's the thing, you know, this idea of even like a correct language is relative to context. Specifically, it's setting in its time and it is the native speakers of that language, AKA the black community that decides what is correct and what's not. And so I say this to flag this, that racial bias against AAVE is often a social construct built to protect whiteness and to help you understand why some of you might be feeling a level of disapproval and resistance to this word. And so if you're feeling a level of resistance, it's not to a word, it's the black history and black culture. Some general examples of um, what this could look like include culture appropriation. So again, something about culture, I'm thinking about traditions, beliefs, practices, customs of any given racial, ethnic, religious group, et cetera. And that can include elements like language, art, music, et cetera, et cetera. And when I talk about a, to appropriate means to take without permission. I recently saw on Design Twitter, it's like a few weeks, a month ago, a well-known older white man in UX tweeted, someone just told me I was OG. That's a good thing, right? You know, and obviously this person's doing it for attention because they could just Google it and figure it out themselves. But what was interesting is they tweet out this question. They tweet out this observance. I've been called an OG. And so you have kind of white people in the, con in the comments. Some are saying, yeah, it's a good thing. You have some white people in the comments who are like, mm, I think that's a thing of, you know, I think that's a sign of ageism. And then you have some white people in the comments who are also sharing GIFs of like Snoop Dogg, Ice T, and whatnot which is actually a form of digital blackface. And actually, if you Google digital blackface descout, you'll see an amazing article by the one and only Jaron Miller on this topic. What is digital blackface? And I see a lot of it, especially within the UX community. But you know what's interesting? And probably a flag in terms of, mm, is this cultural appropriation or not? Is that what you did not have in the comments was a lot of black people plus wanting it liking it, applauding it, and accepting it because of what was happening, because of the use of that language. So OG, original gangster, is A-A-V-E. It's coined in the 1970s by the LA Crips. Um, and what it originally meant was original gangster. And it was a word then to, you know, to describe how the group saw themselves as the first, the originals. And this word has evolved to mean, you know, original, exceptional, authentic, admirable, et cetera, et cetera. And so just a general rule of thumb and heuristic you can apply to this is that if you don't see the majority, the majority of people from that culture plus wanting, clapping, and accepting a type of language that's being used, it's cultural appropriation. Other examples of this 
include white people um, assuming that folks of color are, you know, who are customers are actually employees at, at a store. This happens a lot, especially in the States. A white man saying he'll donate to a nonprofit in Africa if he gets a lot of new social media followers. True story from one of uh, your well-known UX leaders. And it's important to like think about as you're understanding the different levels of caucasity and the way that they can play out, because really at the end of the day, when you start to boil it down, and really at the end of the day, the reason why you should actually care about this and tune into this idea of caucasity is that caucasity leads to harm. And that caucasity can be traumatic. And so our collective understanding of caucasity begs the UX community to ponder and act on these three questions. How can we understand the dynamics of whiteness? What are the ways unchecked caucasity leads to harm in the UX community? And how do we move closer to maturity and accountability? Now again, just for reference, and in case you missed it on the stage, I am a black woman, so I'm gonna be sharing my experience around this topic as a black woman. And for other folks who are from other racial and ethnic communities, I like to share what I'd like for us, what I'd like for you to also not do today. We're not gonna play the who is more oppressed game. You know this game. This is the game where different groups try to one-up each other in terms of who has experienced the most harm from racism and all the things that come with that. And I think it's just better to acknowledge that all forms of oppression that racial and ethnic groups experience are horrific and wrong. From slavery, to intermittent camps, to residential indigenous schools, to genocide and more, it's all incredibly damaging and, and horrific. And so playing this game is destructive to unity. It negates our experiences, causes a lot more division, and maybe I would say bold enough to say that it's an act of violence that is counterproductive to combating racism. And so as you listen to your black colleague today share their experience, resist the temptation to play this game. I'm gonna paraphrase bell hooks here, but we must raise our consciousness and refuse to be pitted against one another because only white supremacy benefits. <laughs>